Really nice to see you, Aviva. Oh, it's lovely to see you too, Naomi, and to see everybody who is here with us in the Zoom, as well as those of you who are watching at home for this session, which is the final session of Jewish Renaissance and the Lions Learning Project, the Yiddish. Um, we started off by um, looking at Reitman, um, an amazing Jewish woman writer in Yiddish. And we're finishing with someone who is an amazing Jewish, Yiddish and Hebrew and English writer in her own right, as well as an academic commenting on others. So before I introduce her properly, though, just to set the tone, I'm going to show you all the mug that I'm drinking out of. I don't know if you can see, but it's a Freud mug, which says, when you say one thing but mean your mother. <laughs> um, and on the back is Freudian sips. And I'm showing you this because to use Yiddish word, tchotchkes, um, Nomi, amongst other accolades, is the biggest collector of Freud memorabilia and tchotchkes I've ever met in my life. So we're, we're really going to enjoy her take on Freud in a few minutes. Um, at one point in time, I know the book she's going to talk about was about being in Freud's closet um, and pulling him out of the closet, not in terms of sexuality, but I think in terms of all the other guff that was in Naomi's closet with him. So you're going to have lots of fun this evening. And just to introduce her properly, because she deserves a proper introduction, Dr Naomi Seidman is the Chancellor Jackman Professor of the Arts in the Department for the Study of Religion and the Centre for Diaspora and Transnational Studies at the University of Toronto. She was a 2016 Guggenheim Fellow, and her publications include The Marriage Plot, or How Jews Fell in Love with Love and with Literature, and most recently before this book, Sara Schneera and the Beis Yaakov Movement, A Revolution in the Name of Tradition, which won a National Jewish Book Award in Women's Studies. Her podcast on leaving the ultra-Orthodox Jewish world, Heretic in the House, was released last year by the Shalom Hartman Institute. Um, I'd recommend you all to listen to it. It's much more insightful than unorthodox was. But um, it's also worth listening to to hear every variety of tone you could possibly imagine for the word nebuch. <laughs> um, but Naomi is the exact opposite of a Nebuch. Um, she's a brilliant academic. She's going to be talking tonight about her new book, whose official title is Translating the Jewish Freud. Um, and in particular, she's going to be exploring what the Yiddish press made of psychoanalysis. So Naomi, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, Aviva. I met Aviva at uh, Limud last a winter, which was the best thing that happened. I mean, I had a good time for a lot of reasons, but it's wonderful. And it's really uh, such an honor to be invited to this forum. And I'm going to share my screen because I'm, I, I'm not gonna read from a paper. I'll just show you some stuff from the Yiddish press. And um, hopefully you'll be able to see this. Uh, Let's see. So um, I'll start by saying that for a while I thought about uh, titling my book um, Psychoanalysis for Diabetics. And the reason why is because I was thinking about the quote, the famous quote by Karl Krauss, psychoanalysis was the disease of assimilated Jews. Eastern European Jews may do with diabetes. So the basic idea is that psychoanalysis is too sophisticated for Yiddish speaking, the Yiddish speaking masses. Um, they couldn't afford uh, psychoanalysis. They couldn't afford to have neuroses. They had to make do with uh, diabetes and similar diseases. There's Karl Krauss. Can't remember why I put Max Eitingon on this slide, but he was an Eastern European Jewish psychoanalyst of which there were many, I guess, to argue with Karl Krauss. Um, so the question is, what is psychoanalysis for people who can't afford it or people who are somehow have a particular relationship to it, which is 
They come from the same place that Freud's ancestors come from, but they're not quite sophisticated enough for psychoanalysis proper. So it turns out Karl Kraus was wrong that Eastern European Jews did not always make do with diabetes. Some of them thought they could have diabetes and some interest in Freud. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Am I talking too loud or is this just the right volume? I guess you could shut me up if I'm too loud for you, which people can't always do when I'm in the same room as them. Um, so as just an example of uh, the fact that not all Eastern European Jews may do with diabetes is the Lubavitcher Rebbe, I think this is the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, Shalom Dov Bershnirsen, who was a very early patient, not of Freud, but of one of Freud's uh, students. He was actually Stekel's first patient. And it's very possible, he, he came to Vienna to be treated for paralysis of the right hand um, and was looking for a neurologist. And at that point, Freud was both a neurologist and a psychoanalyst. And that was how he encountered Freud. And Freud kind of um, gave him uh, Wilhelm Stekel as his psychoanalyst, as a budding psychoanalyst. Stekel had grown up in the Hasidic town of Boyan. So it's very possible that this early psychoanalytic treatment was conducted at least partly in Yiddish. It's not entirely clear from Stekel's state uh, case study that it's even Schneerson. There's still some debate about that who's being described. But we do know that Schneerson sought neurological treatment. Um, he was diagnosed as having a psychological ailment, not a physiological ailment. Um, a problem with his profession. <laughs> so I guess the Lubavitcher Rebbe would probably have problems with his profession. That's a whole other story that you can look up if you're curious. Um, I'm going to start with actually a page from uh, something from the um, the Yiddish press, but it's English section, which I think is interesting and significant, um, which was a, a, a Freudian lullaby contest that was announced in the summer of 1930, um, which maybe gives us a little clue as to how Freud was seen in the Yiddish press. Um, one good contest deserves another. A prize of 15, count them, $15 will be paid for the cleverest Freudian lullaby for a Jewish baby. So the baby had to be Jewish. Um, poor Dr. Freud. Um, and uh, there it is. Luckily, we have the actual, turns out over 1,100 people submitted uh, lullabies to the contest. Here's the announcement of who won. Um, lullaby contest won by David Greenberger, Freud Akin. This is one of the few ones in, in, in German. Most of them were in English. There were a few in other languages. Um, here we have it. 1,100 Freudian lullabies for Jewish babies were received from readers living in 36 states, Canada, Mexico, and British Islands, British Isles. Additional Freudian lullabies next Sunday. So what can we learn from this? And pay attention also to Polly Lerner, whose name will come up in a minute. So here's uh, a little bit from Morris Milton Dick Stein's lullaby. One of the things we can learn is that there are at least some people who knew a whole lot about psychoanalysis. I actually, this particular um, writer knew so much, I actually tried to discover whether he himself was a psychoanalyst. So we have here, it's a kind of Homeric, uh, Ode, sing of regressions, repressions. I'll just say this this a lullaby. It starts with the child, the mother singing a lullaby about the moon and a tree, and the child saying, I'm not interested in that. What I want to hear about is psychoanalysis. And this is from the perspective of the baby. So this is a Jewish baby singing about psychoanalysts, sing of reg repressions, regressions, the sexes. Breuer, Jones, Martin, Rivers, Hollingsworth, which um, there we even have Dr. Janet pronounced Jeanette to rhyme with uh, yet. Um, this is somebody who clearly knew a lot about uh, psychoanalysis in terms of 
the joke, which is that the baby is saying, I'm not interested in your little lullaby. I'm interested in hearing about Freud. It might say something about the new generation of uh, children of immigrants who were becoming interested in Freud. Um, it might say something about the sort of absurdity of lullabies in which it's a very tired adult, typically, who's trying to put a very wakeful child to sleep. Um, and it's the child who has a lot more to say than the adult. Um, other than that, there isn't anything so particularly Jewish about this one. Um, and I'll give you another uh, lullaby. Um, this one is interesting. Sleep, you chazer, don't you know? I want to see a movie show. If you sleep, I'll buy you toys like you saw by Levy's boys. Um, the humor here is familiar immigrant humor, um, dialect English, you could say. Um, same thing, the, the the old joke in which the, the, the lullaby is actually something that psychoanalysts have spent a lot of time working on. The lullaby is one of these texts that has, um, let's call it a, 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 a melody that's supposed to communicate sleepiness to the baby and often lyrics that are an expression of the grown-up's frustration, right? So murderous impulses cloaked by a soothing rhythm so that the baby will go to sleep. What's interesting here is that the murderous impulses um, Maybe I'll just talk about the, the the top little snippet. The murderous impulses are expressed in Yiddish, which and the nice, uh, let's say, sentiments of the parental sentiments or the maternal sentiments form a kind of facade that is expressed in English. So politeness is English and Impoliteness is Yiddish. This is very frequent in Yiddish folklore. Yiddish is the more direct and intimate language and the ideology that places Yiddish as the lower language, right? Yid, the Yid is the Id that goes all the way back to Ernest Jones. Uh, the idea that Yiddish is the language in which both Jewish intimacy and let's say, um, unsocial or socially stigmatized emotions are expressed. Um, and I think you get a little taste of that in this bilingual humor. And if you remember, I talked about Polly Lerner. She was somebody, and among the many people on the English pages of the forward, who tried to encourage the immigrant generation to speak a beautiful English. Um, so the, basically the forward was sending a, mis, a mixed message through its lullaby contest. On one half of the page, somebody telling them to speak a beautiful, civilized English. On the other half of the page, uh, immigrant parents being rewarded for uh, speaking Yiddish in funny and illuminating ways. So this kind of um, role of Yiddish and the dis dissemination of psychoanalysis. Oh, here we go. Oh, no, this is Lillian Eichler foreign accent to handicap. Um, the imp uh, definitely handicapped is that um, impressionable youngster who hears nothing but broken, incorrect speech on the left side of the page, on the right side of the page. Go to sleep, you squawking brat. Daddy dear is not so fat. Um, darn the nozzle, what's the use? In other words, um, the problems of the immigrant generation appearing spread out on one page, which is uh, speaking softly and beautifully in mellifluous tones to your child so they can become Americanized. And the part that Freud gives the Yiddish press permission to is go ahead and let it all out and we'll publish it. And somehow in the middle, something by Leonard Lyons that separates the polite Lillian Eichler for the impolite readers. So what is this about? Let's just take a giant step back and understand what we're looking at when we talk about Freud in, in the Yiddish press. And one of the things you have to understand is that there were many, many, many newspapers. This is the height of the Yiddish daily press. So during the period, during the, the, the First World War and the Second World War, 
There were over 50 Yiddish dailies in the world, all over Warsaw, the United States, um, South America, Canada, certainly Eastern Europe. Um, Argentina had three. So basically we're dealing with a, a very hungry machine of generating content for the Jewish masses. And this hungry machine, let's call it, had two desires. One was to entertain the masses, to keep them buying the daily newspapers. And the other one was to educate them to modernity, to teach them about the great world, um, and to give them um, nutritious content, let's call it. Generally, these two aims worked somewhat awkwardly together, right? The stuff that educated, informed, um, Americanized in the case of the American press, and the stuff that entertained that was sexual or raw or spoke to everyone's basis instincts. Um, Freud had the rare capacity to do both at the same time, to educate, to be a kind of high cultural touchstone that would make the reader feel sophisticated and in touch with difficult ideas and to entertain. Very few people could do both at once. Einstein, a little bit with his wild hair, Freud consistently fulfilled both aims of the Yiddish press in one stroke. Um, and one way of understanding this is that Freud, one other way in which Freud did both of these things is that the Yiddish press, and not just the Yiddish press, also the New York Times, also Time Magazine, had a kind of obsession with famous people. So the hundred most famous thinkers, right? The world's most, this one actually goes back to 1999. So the game isn't entirely over, but the Jewish press and not just the Yiddish press, but the Hebrew press and the popular mass press was interested in famous people. And in fact, regularly ranked them and what you see here on the bottom is and this is from, I think, some local newspaper. Who are the most famous Jews in the world? So what you have here is, um, um, you know, a list of lists of famous Jews, right? So what this did was not only educate and entertain, but also feed Jewish narcissism that so many of the Nobel Prize winners, so many of, you know, are Jewish. And without exception, these, so here are the most famous Jews in the world, according to, I forget which local newspaper. Um, and uh, uh, I'm trying to find, see where Freud is. Freud, it, Almost without exception, without exception, I think you could say every list had Einstein and Freud. And um, this explains why Einstein and Freud, when they happened to both be in Berlin in the Christmas of 1926, I think, um, everyone around them encouraged them to meet each other as the two most famous Jews in the world. And um, they met each other and Freud wrote in his diary, it was a perfectly pleasant meeting because Einstein understands as much about psychoanalysis as I do about the theory of relativity. So um, th these are some examples in, in terms of uh, the New York Times, they actually had in the thirties, a big argument about who the most famous Jews were because um, according to um, Stephen, Stephen Wise, who was on the list, there was a list of famous Jews that had like the top 10 and then the bottom 20. And I think the fact that he was in the bottom 20 made him object to the New York Times, including Jews that he didn't consider real Jews. They were famous, but not famous as Jews. So these kinds of ridiculous arguments generated content. Um, by the way, the second one is Professor Einstein. Generally, it's Einstein and Freud, and they need no introduction. And then you get to number three and various other people 
Henri Bergson, and suddenly you just really have to start explaining who these people are. There's nobody, it's like number one and number two, and then number three is like way down there. They were by far the most. So not only that, but um, Freud was was always, you know, there was always something to say about Freud. So in um, 1925, the idea that, you know, this was clearly a, a um, newspaper, a publicity stunt by the head of MGM to, to take a boat to a flying trip, but most of it was by boat to Vienna to try to persuade Freud to write a script for Hollywood. So Freud generated publicity even for other people. And he was supposed to write a love story. That was the idea. And why Goldwyn had to actually, you know, Goldwyn, the story, they followed the story step by step. Goldwyn gets on the boat. Goldwyn gets off the boat. Um, Freud wouldn't even see him. He wasn't interested in playing that particular game. So this was some of the ways that the Yiddish uh, press uh, dealt with uh, why they had such a fascination with Freud. Freud was basically fodder for all the purposes of the Yiddish press. Um, even in far-flung um, Buenos Aires, which, as I said, had um, a particular fascination with Freud, and all of you will be nodding and you'll be, you'll be going, well, of course, everyone knows that Buenos Aires is the capital of psychoanalysis, right? Even the cab drivers are psychoanalyzed or maybe they're also psychoanalysts, right? We all know that about Buenos Aires. But I think this is actually the one sort of historical discovery of my research, which is that most of the scholars of psychoanalysis in Argentina date that interest in psychoanalysis to the 1930s. I have not found a single uh, historian of psychoanalysis in Argentina who says that it started in the 1920s. Whereas if you go to the, um, the Yiddish press in Argentina, you will discover that there were, um, it, for instance, during, I have for some reason for this particular newspaper, I only have about, I only looked at about 25 issues of this newspaper. And out of 25 issues of this newspaper, that's all that was available digitally, 10 of them included mention of Freud, 10 out of 25, um, including um, very long and complex and sophisticated descriptions. This one is Das Unterbewusstseinige und sein Roll in unser psychische Leben. Um, the subconscious and its role in our psychic life. And this is a detailed description of a lecture that was held by someone named Dr. Paulina Rabinovitz in the, um, the Organization for Rus Russian Culture. So what's perfectly clear is that the rest of Spanish-speaking Argentina only discovered psychoanalysis in the 1930s, whereas Yiddish speakers in Argentina knew about psychoanalysis very well, um, beginning in, as far as I can tell, 1925 at the latest, um, and that there is an untold chapter of perhaps the immigrant Yiddish-speaking parents of these Jewish psychologists and doctors, Spanish speaking with Yiddish speaking immigrant parents who were among the earliest proponents of psychoanalysis in the 1930s, 40s and 50s in psychoanalysis in Argentina and are considered the kind of founders of, of psychoanalysis in Argentina. And if you interviewed these people and said, and what did your parents know about, our, about psychoanalysis? You would have discovered that as readers of the Yiddish press, they knew plenty. So um, how did, so we already know that there were lectures. So the press was, the press and the lecture circuit were really should be understood as a single phenomenon that um, the culture of newspaper reading was very closely tied to a culture of public lectures. And um, this was a form, you know, the, a kind of mass entertainment that had the same 
educational slash entertainment goals of the Yiddish press. And the lecturers, people made a living by writing in the Yiddish press and by giving lectures. And as I said, we've seen this in Buenos Aires. This is all over the Jewish world. Um, lecturers slash journalists. So what you have here is um, an advertisement for um, a bunch of lecturers and including the lecturer who was best known for lecturing consistently on Freud in the 1920s, um, Dr. Um, Abraham Glicksmann. So Abraham Glicksmann was a, a, chas a chassid who came from Eastern Europe, who moved to uh, who who moved to Central Europe and studied. And he was known among his friends as the eternal student. He had degrees in philosophy, economics. He actually wrote for the Economist in English. He was a, um, a, a, as I said, a journalist in numerous languages. He had a PhD in political philosophy from a Swiss university. Um, his parents, finally, after 11 years of his accumulating multiple degrees, decided to withdraw their financial support in 1920. And he came back to Eastern Europe um, and tried to figure out how to earn a living, given that he was basically capable of nothing but writing academic papers. And he discovered, not without some bumps, um, that he could make a living among the masses by giving lectures about Freud and other topics. So here, his first and most popular um, subject was Freud. Die Macht von Liebe and Geistigen Leben, um, The Power of Love in Our Spiritual Life, Theoria, Professor Freud, there you go. Um, but that wasn't all he could talk about. Die Freud in der Ebiker Sod, Sod um, Woman and Her Eternal Secret was also his second most popular uh, lecture. Um, does religion have anything more to um, say to modern people? And finally, Spinoza as a spiritual leader. So I think you get a little taste of who this guy Glickman was. Um, in this case, we're fortunate not only to have many, many um, uh, newspaper advertise. He advertised widely, so we know everything he was lecturing about. He also wrote. Um, but we also have a little description um, in the um, in the biographical section of uh, Ravitch's Mein Lexicon, a kind of monument to his acquaintances in interwar Poland, um, that will tell you a little bit about what it was like to hear a Glicksmann lecture. So I'll just say when the Freud fashion hit Jewish Poland, Glicksmann, Glicksmann's star ascended with big and small towns, literally begging him to grace them with a lecture about the great psychologist. Since Dr. Glicksmann was even less capable of speaking to a general audience than a writing for one, his popularity began to wane until someone advised him to sprinkle a few jokes into his material. Glicksmann heeded the advice and the invita invitations began to flow again. But in one shtetl, the audiences found his jokes so side-splittingly hilarious that the convener had to pound on the table. You immature brats, wagon drivers, the professor is providing a serious lecture and you laugh like impudent school children. The room grew somber as a funeral and no one dared even smile at any of the jokes that followed. So what you have here is a kind of the lecture version of the way education and um, entertainment worked um, uh, around Freud. Freud had to uh, entertain and also educate. And in this case, the audience had to be disciplined in order to understand that and in order to at least put forward the educational part of what they were experiencing as opposed to the entertainment part. And I'll just point out, this is almost the opposite of a psychoanalytic session where acculturated Jews, you know, lie on Freud's couch and have to be encouraged to say all the dirty, funny, gross things that they might be thinking. 
um, to speak those things freely. In the case of the Yiddish reader, the free uh, the, the freedom to say those things or think those things had to be tempered by a, a certain kind of um, culture of stop laughing so much and demonstrate your capacity to be educated. So there's a certain kind of chiastic structure. Now, I don't mean to imply that the Yiddish press only um, treated Freud as a kind of object of entertainment and fun. There really was some significant um, education going on. And I will point to the, you know, so when Freud turned 80, when Freud turned 70, big stories all over the Yiddish press. When Freud turned 80, even more so. Um, and there wasn't a single you know, newspaper, maybe the Orthodox newspapers that didn't feature this birthday. Um, people sent their congratulations to Freud through the, the Yiddish press. Um, and Freud was uh, featured in long and complex uh, articles by sophisticated writers explaining who he was. And this one is by Max Weinreich, who was Freud's authorized um, translator in Yiddish, who had a doctorate and uh, Freud considered something of a colleague because of the psychoanalytically oriented work going on at Evo. I think I have a slide about that. And obviously it could be a, 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 the subject of an entirely different lecture of what it meant for uh, psychoanalysis to be going on in Yiddish um, in, in important and sophisticated ways. Um, in, at the end of the 1930s, but that's not the subject of this lecture. But so in the Yiddish press, what did it look like when someone like Max Weinreich contributed? I'll just read a little bit. Professor Sigmund Freud, they love to call him professor. The Jewish press loved its professors. Barimter Forscher von Geistige Krankheiten Wertheint 80 Jahre alt. So Professor Freud, famous, of course, famous is always part of it. Um, investigator of mental illness turns 80 today. Um, and I'll just read, uh, I think that's called the lead. So, Psychoanalyse, der Mittel zu heilen nervöse Kranke, welcher Professor Freud hat entdeckt. So, it's called psychoanalysis, and it's a way of curing mental illness, a bit of an exaggeration. Die Schwierigkeit, die Schwierigkeit. Was Freud had gehat auszustehen zu lieb sein Yiddishkeit, the difficulties that Freud had to overcome because of his being Jewish. Second thing, always mentioned in the Yiddish press, and by the way, Freud talked about how there was a lot of resentment to his ideas, resistance, sorry, resistance to his ideas among the uneducated masses and among many other people. Um, in the case of his Jewish readers, that resistance to the shocking ideas that Freud was propagating was somewhat mitigated by the fact that he was dealing with anti-Semitism. Jews were willing to keep an open mind as long as they can understand that he was in the same boat as them. Um, and then what is a nervous ailment? Obviously mental illness, still of great interest. And then the last little bit, is, oh, the second to last, uh, the curious case of a young woman who suffered from such an ailment. Obviously, we're still reading mentally ill young women, still of great interest. Um, and how Freud treated this young woman through hypnosis. Now, hypnosis by this period was a distant memory in psychoanalysis, but still juicy enough to attract um, the general reader. And the only thing I'll point out um, that also named, deserves a mention here is that despite the forward being a socialist organization, it was politically and culturally, uh, it was, I'm sorry, it was culturally very conservative. And it's not surprising that what you have is a kind of disclaimer from the editorial board. And the disclaimer says, um, we are not, advocating or you know psychoanalysis we understand that many people consider it uh you know consider psychoanalysts charlatans as we understand it the method entirely consists of nervous women 
um, lying around on a bed in a doctor's office for um, weeks on end, weeks on end, they, like if they'd known it was actually years, um, talking of their random thoughts, and this is supposed to heal them. And if it weren't that we respect Dr. Max Weinrach so much, we wouldn't even tell you about it. So they're basically, this is the disclaimer from the editorial board. So the Yiddish press was a little bit uh, skeptical of the ideas of psychoanalysis, while at the same time, perfectly happy to sell newspapers based on fascinating mentally ill young women and persecuted Jews. So I said, I, I, I don't really have time to get into it, but this was also the period in which Freud was actively involved with, with Yiddish speaking psychoanalysis, Max Weinreich, but also others. He was on the editorial, he was on the honorary board of, of YIVO, the Institute for Jewish Research. Um, and here is a class in psychoanalysis. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is, I meant to have a class in psychoanalysis. This is the Tuskegee Institute where Max Weinreich did research on race theory, I, uh, which is a whole other conversation, which if you, we have time to, you can ask me about. And um, here is the entrance hall of YIVO. And this is just to point out that YIVO was dedicated to the study of Eastern European Jews, but it was very far from being a parochial um, um, enterprise. Psychoanalysis was a major tool. Race science was another, another one, which is um, why uh, I have an image from the Tuskegee Institute. And psychoanalysis was um, just among the tools that it used to try to understand um, to understand uh, what it meant to be a Jew. So, and here is uh, the, the first volume of Max Weinreich's authorized um, translation of Freud's work. The only one to be authorized, there were two other ones earlier. Here is a letter from Freud. Um, he says, I'm not gonna write an introduction because if I write an introduction for you, I'll have to write an introduction for all the other translations and I have too many requests, but nevertheless, I'm really happy to see my work being translated into Yiddish and um, I'm holding it in my hand and I'm very sorry I don't speak the language, but I'm holding it in my hand with great, um, respect. And one of the things that's interesting about this document is that we lack the German original. And it doesn't even say there's a German original. It's as if this is this is the Yiddish original that Freud produced. Um, the letter that Freud sent to Weinreich has not survived in any of the archives that I've investigated. Um, so what we have is a Yiddish document in which the original has, has disappeared, proclaiming Freud's respect um, for Yiddish. Um, I'll just end by saying, by talking a little bit about the kind of frenzy around Freud um, in the last years of his life in the Yiddish press as he was um, experiencing Nazism. I mean, this frenzy was so intense. I mean, Freud was in the paper day after day after day after the Anschluss. Um, some there were editors who tried to remind the readers that there were other people who were being persecuted besides Freud. That was how focused um, the Yiddish press was on Freud's travails. And here we have an interview with Freud. This is actually from 1937 by the Yiddish poet and English journalist Judd Teller, um, and who also wrote poetry about his encounter with Freud. So there's um, a, a whole poem cycle about uh, Teller and Freud. And he says, he doesn't say much about Freud's um, understanding of what was going on. It's more this kind of projection of what Freud was saying. I'll read a little bit from this poem. Um, this is uh, for Freud on his 82nd uh, birthday. He says, I'll just translate it for time's sake. Um, he saw the saluting hands, the swastika, he smelled with his uh, intelligent nose um, that old evil blood in young Aryan Shkutzim. Shkutzim is a Yiddish denigrated term for non-Jewish 
uh, boys. So in, uh, some of you might know it. It's young, non-Jewish rascals or um, shkotzim of every, uh, so shkotzim in Hebrew, Yiddish, Judeo-German um, had those for whom he was named, right? For, for Freud's ancestors. That was the word that they chewed like matzah, that they needed like challah, um, that they cursed like havdalah, the 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 ritual of separation. So there's a kind of projection that Freud is looking at the swastikas, and this brings him back to his. Jewish roots, which it undoubtedly did. I mean, it had that effect in different ways on so many people suffering from persecution. And the word he needs to describe these Aryans is available to him only in his ancestral Yiddish. This word in, that 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 separates him from these boys with the swastika. So um, uh, this is what was going on around Freud. A lot of Obviously, there were other things going on also about, you know, how people felt about Moses and monotheism, which we could talk about during the Q&A. Um, but for the most part, there was a kind of coming even closer to Freud through his, um, through his Jewishness, a kind of deep identification. Um, this is a, a, a story in the... Uh, the forward, which we started this presentation with, Freud has a niece at Hunter College. She's learning psychology. So the, the fascination with Freud extended to members of his family. Um, his, his niece that's learning psychology said she didn't, she doesn't agree with all of his, you know, she's interviewed, she doesn't agree with all of his uh, 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 theories. But nevertheless, she thinks he's, you know, an important person. She's very generous to Freud. And um, here you see a, a, a widely circulated um, Freud family tree where we're only interested in one brand. We're interested in the trunk where it becomes clear that Freud's name is actually a traditional Eastern European matronym, right? Uh, named after a great, great, great uh, grandmother, Freda. Um, and there you have Professor Dr. Sigmund Freud. Um, this circulated all over in the Yiddish press. It's now, you can find it in the Bechuch, uh, uh, Yiskar Buch, Buchach or Bechuch was the Ukraine, now in Ukraine was the town that Freud's ancestors came from as regularly mentioned by the Yiddish press and by me, whose father was born in Bechuch. Um, and I wanna end maybe with a, another little story in, from the Yiddish press which is the meaning of I.N. Steinberg and Freud. He describes this meaning at the very end of Freud's life, which took place in London, which are, I, where I believe many of you now are. Um, and I'll read from it and talk a little bit more about it. Um, so Steinberg was a member, as actually a Hasidic territorialist, socialist, anarchist, for anyone who's keeping score very fascinating character who's very active in the London YIVO and who managed to secure a meeting with Freud in the last few um, months of his life at a time when Freud wouldn't even go to the Royal Society to pick up his medal. Um, the only place he wanted to go was the kennel to visit his dog who was in quarantine. And yet he met with, with members of YIVO and um, of course, Freud wanted to say, I hope you don't hate me because of Moses and monotheism. Any Jew who walked by through his door got that spiel from Freud. But here's a moment that's of interest. I told him briefly about the scientific work being carried out at Evo. He expressed his sorrow at not knowing the two languages, Hebrew and Yiddish, which made it impossible to follow what was happening in the Jewish branch of the science. So according to Steinberg, he understood YIVO to be a Jewish branch of psychoanalysis, um, right? Which may or may not have been a Jewish science in its uh, entirety. And now it would be difficult for me to learn them, he joked. Yesterday, I turned 82 and a half. He expressed his willingness to do everything in his power to help YIVO. And then he said, although I haven't reached the level of the Jews of Eastern Europe, I am still a Jew, a godless Jew, I look in your faces and see strong vestiges of my dead father. 
I don't know how to explain it, but there is a great commonality in our blood. So if we take this as correct evidence of what Freud said to his Yiddish speaking interlocutors at the very end of his life, um, there is a certain amount of projection going on in the other direction too. So the those Yiddish readers that comb through um, stories about Freud to find some evidence of his um, his Eastern European background or his feelings about Yiddish or his Jewishness. And actually in the um, in the Teller article that was the last slide, he says, it's so interesting to me that that Freud lived a couple of blocks away from the Chartkover Rebbe, that you know, trying to see some connection between Freud and um, his their Jew, their own Jewishness, trying to forge this connection, that at the end of his life, we have evidence that Freud was playing the same game, that he looked at the face of um, Steinberg and what he saw, you can say the uncanny experience that he had was a resemblance, which I think is kind of evident even in these photographs, between Steinberg and, and his dead father, who also had, um, you know, been... Hasidic for his early life. Um, and I think this kind of brings us full circle to a kind of, not just these Jews who are so outside the sophisticated circle, the rarefied sophisticated circle of psychoanalysis and the psychoanalytic Congress, um, which they could hardly hope to ever be allowed in, but also Freud's own identification, his own projection, if you want to call it that, onto them, um, that this really was at the end of Freud's life for at least a moment or two, if we can believe Steinberg, and I believe we can. We actually have, um, there were three people at this meeting, three YIVO representatives, and two of them described the meeting. So we have two out of three kind of evidence um, that at the very end of his life, Freud returned the favor and saw something also very deep and meaningful to him um, in his Yiddish readers and admirers. So thank you. I'm going to stop my share, and I'm happy to entertain any objections and complaints and um, problems you may have. <laughs> <laughs> You're speaking to a group of Jews. Of course, there will be all of, of those. Course. Of course. So, Is so anything I mean, okay? Was anything <laughs> okay? <laughs> anything. Um, so I'm just going to speak to the audience for a moment and say to you, we only have about 10 to maximum 15 minutes for questions because Naomi has to catch a flight. So if you do have questions, please put a note in the chat or wave at me or put um, your virtual hand up and we'll pull you on screen quite quickly to ask yourself. So, um, yeah. So while everyone else is doing it, let me ask you. I mean, you seem to be convinced that for a moment there was that mirroring back that Freud's, the interest of the Jewish press in Freud was reciprocal. Um, do you feel like that was a product of anti-Semitism, that was a product of just what happens when you age? Um, was it because of that thing of when someone loves you, it's easier to love them back? Or do you think there's there are other reasons why Freud was, was connected to his Yiddish and Hebrew audience in a way maybe the wider world hasn't acknowledged when they depict this very un-Jewish Freud? It was certainly, it wasn't only anti-Semitism, and there were people who sort of woke up to being Jewish. Freud was not among those. Um, Freud established relations with the you know Hebrew University, I think in 1920. By 1930, he was on the board of YIVO. He was, you know, he collected Jewish jokes. Um, his brother, he, I mean, one of the interesting things about this is that the, the whole question of how Jewish Freud was, was a question also for him. Mm -hmm. um, he, and it was a kind of mysterious thing. He talks about it this way in his introduction to what it was that drew him to Jews. 
-hmm. and also didn't draw him to them then he would get annoyed at them people constantly like how much yiddish do you know or what's your jewish name or um, the ways in which we're both drawn to and not drawn to other jews the way in which we feel a kind of he experienced it in a very heightened way because of his fame um he experienced both sides so he you know his first uh the first people who were open to hearing his uh, his ideas were the B'nai B'rith chapter. Um, and he said to them, I feel, you know, I feel something um, when I'm with you. And I wish we could understand what that was. And he um, he says, I, I read a, I read a, a, a theorist of Freud who says, this was an uncanny moment, umheimlich uh, moment. How about it was a heimish moment? I mean, heimish and unheimlich. Like, in other words, the, the idea that it's all psychosexual, as opposed to it being about a certain kind of social dynamic, let's call it, you know, this curiosity we have about who's Jewish and who's not. Like, why do we want to know so badly? And what is that about? And why do we get so much pleasure, you know, at Freud's? He recognized that and he said, one of these days it will be scientifically um, studied. And he said that people take this as some, you know, it, it, it actually was studied. At YIVO was one of the questions of why, at, at YIVO, one of the things that was studied is what's up with all the famous Jews? They were actually studying it. What's up with Jews and their like famous Jew, like the obsession with famous Jews? Um, and they talk about it as a compensatory mechanism for, but, and, and Freud talked about it, you know, he, his, his friend asked him, should I, should I baptize my child? And Freud said, A, it's not going to help. He's still going to experience anti-Semitism and he's not going to get what you get by being Jewish to help him deal with the anti-Semitism. And what you get is immense feelings of superiority, immense ethnic narcissism. Mm -hmm. And ethnic narcissism was be the, the combination of the insult that you deal with by being Jewish and the narcissism. Um, Freud talks about it in letters, but he never made it the subject of his study. At Evo, it was the subject of study. And we're still waiting for the real study about this. Everyone's looking at the Jewish Freud and no one's really looking at the question of why do we care? Why do we need to know? Which I think is the real question. Well, then my book is coming out. Sorry, there goes five minutes of my day <laughs> time. No, absolutely. Well, it's good adverts to um to read Naomi's book. And I'm going to ask Emma to put details of it in the chat. But actually, we're hoping to bring Naomi over for Jewish Book Week next year. Um, and to the Freud Museum in London. So hopefully you'll have a chance in person to follow up on those questions and Naomi to share them with us. Um, at the moment, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. I don't know if anything's oh, going okay. to Emma, but um, I'll ask one more of my own and then we'll see where people are. But let's talk about famous Jews for a minute. I know you went to Vienna recently, didn't you? I did. You did. So I went to Vienna a few years ago and I did, of course, the pilgrimage to the Freud Museum, which is in his old apartment. And I was doing my like, let's hit the Jewish heritage of Vienna thing. And I was standing opposite his apartment and then also thinking about the university is just over there and kind of looking at who else was round about, you know, round the corner is, I don't know if you know, the Edmund Duvall book, The Hair with Amber Eyes is where his family was. Wait, and who? Edmund Duvall, who wrote The Hair with Amber Eyes. I thought you were going to say Herzl. Herzl lived down oh, the I street. was going to say him next. And then down the street is Herzl. So like, I'm there were all these Jews about, and if you think about Herzl, I mean, the, the joke is, you know, can you imagine if he'd ever walked over to his neighbor's flat, knocked on the door and said, I have a dream, <laughs> how Freud would have responded. But it feels like they're so close and yet they're living in parallel worlds. Or what was kind of Freud's response to Herzl, to the Zionism that's around him, to the kinds of other ways that Jewishness in Vienna was going as well as the cultural? 
Wow, that's such a big question. So, yeah, it's interesting. The um, the two dreamers, right? Herzl, mm -hmm. if you will it, it is no dream, though it can also be translated as legend. And, mm -hmm. you know, Freud and the dreamers. And also the fact that in Yiddish, to dream, you know, the Luftmensch, right? The dreamy Jew. Mm -hmm. um, his brother actually... Um, his brother Alexander, who worked for the railroad company, mm -hmm. wrote a a parody of interpretation of dreams in which he he translated the traum as kalimus, so the Yiddish dream. <laughs> he just collected his friend's absurd dreams. So just to add to the high serious, the two high serious designers, the yeah, Freud had a, a you know ambivalent relationship with. Um, with Zionism, which was almost entirely personal. I mean, you know, you can talk about the politics of it. He did, you know, uh, Said with his talk at the Freud Museum in Vienna, it, in London, talks about how, how Freud warned, um, you know, he he said he, he couldn't sign on to various Zionist projects because he was concerned at, about the inhabitants of the land mm -hmm. and that he you know, he didn't think that they were sufficiently being taken into account. But he also, I mean, his son was a Zionist and he had sympathy for that. He mostly was, his most, he mostly was insulted at the fact that it was so hard for the Hebrew University to, to gather funds for the Sigmund Freud chair in psychoanalysis. And as soon as that, um, as soon as all those efforts to create the Sigmund Freud chair fell through, he really got turned off to Zionism and the land of Israel. So it was completely personal in his case, or almost entirely personal. Um, you know, this idea that it went, the first the first uh, psychoanalytic conference, um, out, uh, international congress outside of Europe was in Jerusalem in 1977. And it was billed as the reunion of the, the children of Freud and the children of Herzl. And the you know the two dreamers and Anna Freud gave a very famous talk at that time. She didn't actually deliver it herself. She couldn't make it to the land of Israel. She was um, ill, as you know. Her father had always been with every invitation, and um, she said, "It is we can now say without fear that psychoanalysis is a Jewish science." It's not dangerous to say it anymore, whether it's true or not. I think she didn't, she held off from that, but it can be said at least. So it's a, a, a kind of um, a moment in the history of psychoanalysis when that particular speech was delivered. Um, I, I don't know if that answers the question. Starts to, more than starts to. Um, yeah. I think there's so many questions here. and. For us, it's a really interesting one because obviously this is we London's where Freud ended up, but also we at Jewish Renaissance we've done a lot of work with his children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. So Lucian, who became the artist, his great granddaughter Esther, who is a writer, has done things with us about one of his other sons who was an architect. So we have the very kind of arts and culture Jewish family, and obviously we're also press publication so it's really interesting to see you know I think of us as something very different from the Yiddish press yet we are still obsessed yeah. to an extent by that what that ethno-narcissism you talk about the celebrity family <laughs> so yeah I just discovered something really insane which is that Freud's great or maybe great I guess uh, Lucian Freud's daughter Charlotte is married to Rupert Murdoch's grandson? Not, is it Charlotte? I thought it was one of the other Freud's, but yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. This is, this is a very crazy form of Jewish geography. And we're yeah. no longer in the realm of Jewish geography. There, there's a whole kind of Freud family piece to be done, um, which maybe we'll continue to do when you come to London next I cannot month. wait. Remind me when um, the festival is. It's March, end of February. Beginning I'm there. March, I'm there. Sign yeah. me up. So I'm going to pause us now and say to you, well, I hope this has whetted your appetite. You'll have a chance to continue on the conversation um, in the future. 
I'm very, very grateful to Naomi for joining us, but I'm going to bring um, Emma in to do a proper vote of thanks and just tell you what's to come. Thank you so much for that really fascinating talk, especially fitting us in uh, before your flight. Um, I think Jewish narcissism is definitely something that I'll be taking away from this and thinking about a lot more going forward. Certainly lists of who's Jewish and which Jews, which famous people are Jewish is uh, still still a, a pastime that we have to this day. Um, thank you so much. Um, coming up at Jewish Renaissance, uh, we okay, have... Okay, if I take off, please. Yes, yes. Thank much. <laughs> <laughs> Safe travelling. Um, yes, so coming up at Jewish Renaissance, we have a whole host of events that are already up on the website that you can book um, and you'll see them advertised in our upcoming issue, which will hit your doorsteps next week. Um, and the main one that I want to advertise if we are short for time is the Midlands trip. Um, so on the, 8th, on the 9th and 10th of July, we'll be heading to the Midlands to explore its hidden Jewish connections. Um, we will have privileged access to the Walsall archives um, to look at the work of sculptor Jacob Epstein. And we'll also be heading to the Leicester Gallery um, because they have an incredible collection of German expressionism that uh, is to do with the legacy of emigres um, coming from Europe during the Second World War. Um, and we also are privileged to be led by uh, Monica Bohm Duschen, who will also take us on uh, a tour of St. Matthew's in Northampton, which has artwork by both Graham Sutherland and Henry Moore. Um, there's actually only 10 places left for that trip. So if you are interested, um, have a look at the website. And I'm just putting a link in the chat so you can see all of our events coming up in uh, from May to July. Okay, thank you so much. And just to bring the talk full circle, Jacob Epstein's daughter, was married to Lucian Freud, um, Sigmund Freud's grandson. So there's the the whole um, Jewish family, Freud family narcissism continues on. But we'll 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 look at um, Epstein's relationship to the Freud family and Epstein's own kind of very very complicated life on that trip, but mostly through what happens in his art. Um, and most interestingly in the Walsall collection, particularly are his bronzes of his daughter, um, where there are very Freudian stories um, to go along with those bronzes. Um, thank you so much, Emma, for bringing that up. Thank you for programming all of this. Um, thank you to all of you for sticking with us for the series. And just to say to everyone, because we won't see you before, Happy Pesach. Um, we wish you all a Chag Sameach. Um, and we hope to see you again after the break. Thank you very much and good night.